So remember, the three techniques to specify a grammar, sorry, to specify syntax of a language are grammars, finite state machines, and regular expressions. And we said last time that what we're going to study, what we're going to learn in this chapter are grammars and finite state machines, and it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course to learn about regular expressions. All right, what are the four parts of a grammar? Uh, well, can we kind of do them in order? What, yeah, what is N? Non -term okay, a non-terminal alphabet. And then what was the second one? A terminal. A terminal alphabet. So now the terminal alphabet consists of the characters that you actually see in a sentence in the language. And then what's the third one? Yes, a set of rules of production. And then what was the fourth one? Start a start symbol. And the start symbol is an element of what? N. N, yes. It's one of the non-terminals. So here are the four parts of a grammar. And what we looked at last time was uh, we ended on figure 7.1. And this is a grammar for a, an identifier. And we looked at these, we said it has nine rules of production. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, what a derivation is. So what ha the way a grammar works is you use the rules of grammar to derive a valid sentence in the language. That's how it works. And what you do, the, the technique for doing this is you start with a non-terminal. And guess which non-terminal you start with? the start symbol. And so to derive a valid string in the uh, language, so here's a derivation, we start with an identifier. Is there really a specific one? Or is... There's always only one start symbol. And the start symbol is the bracketed word identifier? This, well, in this grammar it is. In this particular grammar, it is. But every grammar, every grammar has a start symbol that is that is an element that is a non-terminal. And the way you derive a valid string in the language is to start with that start symbol. Are you with me? So anyway, in this particular one, the, our start symbol is identifier. So we start with this. Now what happens is, <clears throat> at each step in the derivation, what you do is you pick a production rule. And, and you derive, and so, and, and you derive, okay? So with this particular derivation, we're gonna start with rule three. So if you look at rule, if you look back at rule three here, let's look, look back at rule three. Rule three says what? An identifier produces what? Those are production rules. So what does a producer, what does an identifier produce? An identifier concatenated with a digit. Now rule three is identifier is identifier concatenated with digit. Are you with me? So here, so with this rule three, we say, so now, but, but now this double stemmed arrow is derives. So an identifier derives an identifier concatenated with a digit by rule three. Does everybody see that? So single arrow is produces, double arrow is derives. Are we good? <clears throat> and then what, you just keep picking rules and substituting. So, for example, if you want to pick rule 9, if we, if we look back at rule 9, a di we see that digit does what by rule 9? Produces a 3. So in this next step of the derivation, that digit produces 3. So we replace digit with 3 because that's what it produces from the rule of production. And why do we use a double arrow? Because this is a derivation. So a double arrow is derives. And, but we derive by substituting in using each rule of production, which is a single, the productions are single arrows. Are you with me? So this is a derivation, so it's double stemmed arrow. All right, and then you just keep picking rules until, until you get to what? A string of all what? Terminals. terminals, yeah. So here we have a non-terminal identifier, so we can pick another rule. So let's just pick rule th two. If you go back and look at rule two, what does an identifier produce? Here, what is it? Let's look at rule two. What does uh, uh, identifier produce by rule two? Identifier. identifier concatenated with a letter. Okay, so where we had an identifier before, we have identifier concatenated with a letter, and we bring the three down. So everybody, so let's just keep substituting. So by rule five, you can say a letter produces a digit. By rule two, you can see an identifier produces an identifier concatenated with a letter. 
by rule four, you can say that a letter produces A, and by rule one, you can say an identifier produces a letter. Let's go back and review rule one. That's an interesting one. See, so rule one is identifier produces a letter. So we come back here. So by rule one, uh, th that produces a letter. And then by rule six, C a, we, we, a letter produces a C. So what we have proved here by this derivation is that CAB3 is a valid identifier because we derived it. Well, okay, that's a good question. What happens is, for example, on the third line down, we, had, we, we, have, we have derived an identifier concatenated with a letter, concatenated with three. It doesn't matter what order you pick. You could either pick, you could pick a production rule for an identifier or you, could put a, or you could pick a production rule for a letter. So it doesn't matter what order you do it in. I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah, so you know you have, but but the point is, is that once you get to all terminals, then that is a valid sentence in the language. Does everybody see how that worked? So cab three, all right. So that's how you have to, have to do a derivation with this one, and then we have this other symbol. Derives with an asterisk. That means derives in zero or more steps. That's kind of a, like a closure operation. Okay, so you can summarize the previous eight derivation steps as identifier derives in zero or more steps CAB3. All right, now does everybody see how derivation works? You just substitute in. Okay. So let's do another example. Figure 7.2 is a grammar. And what are the four parts of a grammar? Non-terminal alphabet, terminal alphabet, rules of production, start symbol. So the non-terminal alphabet, or what are the non-terminal symbols in this grammar? I, F, and M. Okay, I think M, I think I picked M because it's magnitude, I'm not sure. Anyway, I don't remember what the I and the F stand for. And then the terminal, the, the terminals in this are, I didn't want to have a, you know, this D represents a digit. I didn't want to make it long and have a digit produce a zero or one or two or three or four or five or six. So anyway, so we'll just, for this one, the terminal alphabet is just a plus sign, a minus sign, and a D. The rules of production are what? I produces an F concatenated with an M. Rule two, an F produces a plus. Rule three, an F produces a hyphen. Rule four, an F produces a what? An empty string, yeah, empty, yeah, the, an empty character, right? An empty string, okay? And then an M produces a what? A D concatenated with an M, and then an M in rule six can also produce a D. And our start symbol is what? I. I, okay, so now let's do a few derivations with this. Oh, one more thing. Uh, it's common in grammar theory to, to, instead of listing every single rule separately, is to combine them. So you see how in our rules of production we have rules two, three, and four. Our F produces a plus, rule three is F produces a hyphen, rule four is F produces an empty string. Well, see that vertical bar here means or. So that's really just an abbreviation for three separate rules. Is everybody clear on that? And then M produces a D or a D concatenated with a capital M. Yeah? So let's do it. So can you see that this, here's a few, a few simple derivations. Do you see now on this slide that, that I, what do we have? What, what does this slide show? It shows that I produces in zero or more steps hyphen DDD. Now, can you see how that derivation worked? What, was, what, did we, what did we use for the first, I didn't list the rules here, but what did we use for the first rule? Number one. Number one. Are you with me? And what did we use for the second one? It looks like we replaced an M with a what? A DM, so that was rule number what? Five. Is everybody clear? Oops. Everybody clear? And then we, uh, uh, we did it at five again, right? And then there must be a rule that says an M produces a D, right? Yeah, you're right. That is rule six. And then what did we use for F? F produced the what? The hyphen. So that last step was rule three. Does everybody see how that worked? 
Okay, so there's another, here's another derivation. You can now tell me with this derivation, I produces in zero more steps DD. Can you tell me what the rule was for the, for the um, last to get from FDD to just DD? What, what's that rule? Yeah, the empty stream, right. So F produces the, uh, that would, so the last one for that was um, rule what? Rule four. So everybody see that that uses rule four to get that derivation? And then here's another one with a plus DDD. DDD. -D -D. Right? So you see how that empty string is kind of handy. It says this, the leading plus or minus sign is optional in a signed integer. See, so it's, you can, that's kind of ha a handy, handy way to, to, to make that rule. Yeah? Uh, you could change the order of like on making like the F to a plus or hyphen like at the start. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it does, the order is, is, you could do it either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the order, so like in the first derivation, you could have on the very, on the second step, you could have turned the F to a hyphen right, right there and then, yeah. Yeah, that's... So that's all possible and legal. All right? Now, there's a really important concept in languages, um, and it's uh, the difference between a context-free language and a context-sensitive language. Actually, let me make that more specific. Let's apply the context-free and context-sensitive to grammars as opposed to languages, okay? so. So a context-free grammar, in a context-free grammar, the production rules have a specific restricted form. Now if you go back here to, let's go back here to um, figure 7.2. What do we notice in figure 7.2? What do we notice is on, first let's look at the rules of production. What do we notice that is on the left-hand side of the arrow in every single rule? What is on the left-hand side of an arrow? How many? Just one. A single non-terminal. And when we went through this, when we went through uh, this derivation the, here, these these derivations, we picked a single non-terminal and we used that production rule to replace it by what was on the right-hand side of the production rule. Are you with me? So there is a single non-terminal. So that means because. In that grammar, there was a single non-terminal on the left-hand side of every production rule. That means that that grammar is context-free. So that is a context-free. That's what a, a context-free grammar means. That's what it means for a grammar to be context-free. Is that for every production rule, there's a single non-terminal on the left-hand side of every production rule. Okay? So that was an example of a context-free. Okay, well... <clears throat> Context sensitive is defined to be what? Not context free. So therefore, what, but there must be at, at least one production rule that has what? More than one. Yeah, yeah, not just one non terminal on the left hand side. Do you have a single terminal one? There must be at least. Hmm? Like, are you allowed to have a a terminal one? Or? No, you actually you're not allowed to have a terminal on the left-hand side. But you can have more than one non-terminal on the left-hand side. All right, so that's the definition of a context-free. Now here's a, here's a really slick little grammar that illustrates context-sensitive. And we, we need to understand this, this concept of context sensitivity. So let's take a look at figure 7.3. What is the non-terminal alphabet in figure 7.3? Capital A, capital B, capital C. Are we good? And then what is the terminal alphabet? Little a, little b, little c. And now P, how many rules of production do we have? We've got six. But look, what about production rule one? That looks like a single terminal on the left-hand side. Rule two looks like a single terminal on the left-hand side. But what about rule three? more than just a single terminal on the left-hand side. And what does rule three say you can do? If you have a big C and a big B, you can replace that with what? Big B, big C. Yeah, you can flip them. Only just, the, the, this is just the B and the C. And it's only going that one way. Notice that we don't have a BC produces a CB. 
Is everybody clear? What about rule four? Now this is an interesting one. What about rule four? What does rule four say you can do? What happens in rule four, production rule four? Yeah, so which one so which one is changing? The big B is changing to a what? Little a little B. But the first B is not changing. But the first B is not changing. Now that's interesting. Would you be allowed to have a rule in which the little B changed or no? Yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah, you could. Okay. But look, let's think about what's happening. Do you under, do you see that in rule four, rule four is not Rule four is not this. This is not a rule in the grammar. You're not allowed to do this. Well, you are allowed, you're kind of allowed to do it, but what does rule four say? You can only do this if there is a what? A little b to the left of the what? Big b. So in other words, you're allowed to change big b to little b, but only in the what? Starts with a c. Only in the context of being to the right of a little b. What does context mean? When, when you take something out of, when, if, if somebody accuses you of taking their, co their statement out of context, what are they accusing you of doing? Not understanding the full picture. Well, how do you understand the full picture? They say, you, you, took, my, you took my statement out of context. What do they say? What, what does that mean? Oh, not misquoting. Yeah, they're quoting it accurately. They're quoting that sense, but they said no, they, they, they're not, you're not being accused of, 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 of not saying what you said. You did write that or you did say that, but when they say you're, you, you took it out of context, what does they mean? She took it out of the scope of the conversation. And what is the scope of the conversation? Before and after. What went before and what went after? The surrounding. The surrounding, yeah. What was surrounding? Yeah. You see? To take something out of context means Means what it means is that what went before and or what went after that matters, and that's what this is. Do you see? That's what this is. What it, what this is saying is that you can change a big B to a little B, but only in the context that it is to the right of a little B. You see? So context. You you see why that's called context sensitive. It's a context, this, that's a context sensitive rule. And similarly, what about rule five? Okay. You can change a what to a what? A big C, a big C to a what? Little C. To a little C, but only if it's what? The big C is to the what? <laughs> to the right of a little B. Does everybody see how that, what that's saying? And what about rule six? You can change a what to a what? No, you can change a big C to a little C, but only if it's where? To the left, to the right of a little C, and then the little C stays, stays the same. All right, is everybody clear? And now, what is our start symbol? A. So now let's do the derivation. Now watch this. So here's a derivative. We start with the start symbol, right? A. Now I think there's only. Oh, no, I guess there's two things we can do. We, can, we could use rule two or we could use rule one. We're going to use rule one. Does everybody see that this is rule one? Okay. Now, let's do rule one again. If we do rule one again, what happens? What do you get? A. Little a, and then what? A little a. A little a. Big a. Big, a, big, big b, big c, and then what? Or just big B, C. Yes, big B, big C, right? Now, does everybody see how, what, what happened there? Okay. So that big A got replaced by a little a, big A, big B, big C. So we, that, that's rule one, all right? So now what we're going to do is let's use rule two. Now, what is rule two? Let's go back and see what rule two. What does rule two say? Big A produces what? Little a, little b, big C. So does everybody see that that big A is little a, little b, big C, and then we still have the big b, big C, big b, big C. Are you with me? Is everybody clear? Okay. 
And now what we're going to do is, you see how we have that CB, CB, C? And remember what we could do with the C, big C, big C? Uh, big, sorry, big C, big B. Big B, big C. So that's rule two, All right? Is everybody clear? And now, and that, uh, no wait, sorry, that was rule three, right? Is it rule three that allowed us to switch the B and the, the CB? Yeah. Okay, so there's rule three. And now look, we can do rule three again with that CB. And then we can do what? I think we can do rule three again, can't we? Because don't we still have a CB? Don't we still have a CB? So you use rule three again. And so now we have this. Are we good? But now, look what we can start doing now. What do we have? A little b and a big b. And what did we say that we could do? What, what, what could happen to big b? It could change to what? Little b. Only if, but uh, only if there's a what? A little b to let. So we can do that. Rule four. And now what, what rule now? Four. Rule four again. And so there's another b. And now what? We can change a what? The C. The C to a what? A little C. A little C, rule five, a little C, rule six, and a little C, boom. And we have, there we have it. When you have like conditional rules like this, it's possible to get to something where you can't change anything. Like you can get stuck. Right? Yeah, you can get, yeah, that's a good point. You can, wait, ah, that's a really good point. Sometimes in a derivation you might be able to, you might, you might get stuck, yeah. And then you would just conclude that well, it's you not, just... Like, that is not valid, so it's in the uh, Well, but you haven't... If you get stuck, that means you still have some non-terminals, so you're not really making a statement about well, a sequence of terminals. Like whatever that sequence that you changed, like, that start sequence is not valid. Well, somewhere along the line, I mean, hopefully the grammar is able to produce at least some... Oh, not the whole grammar, but, like, that sentence in the grammar is not. Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. We, uh, what, you, what you're talking about is, um, a, what we are doing is we are starting with the grammar and the start symbol and we are producing, we are um, deriving arbitrary strings, valid sentences in the language. The parsing problem is given a string of terminals, can you derive it? That's a set, that's, we're going to talk about that in a minute. And so yeah. the question that you're asking is kind of like that. Well, yeah, there are certain things that cannot be derived. From. Yes, yes, there are certain things that cannot be derived. Yeah. In fact, what do you think this grammar is? Do you think, in this grammar, do you think you could produce, do you think you could drive A, A, B, B, C, C? Yes. No. Actually, you can. Do you think you could, you could you, do you think you could do, yeah. And could, do you think you could do A A A B B B C C C? A A A. Oh, we just did that one. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Now, do you think we could do A A A A B B B B C C C C? I think you can. I think you can. Yeah. In fact, with this language, but with this particular grammar, the language that it produces has what? an equal number of A's, and an equal number of B's, and an equal number of C's. With Always. this... Hmm? Always. Actually it does. Always. You can, uh, you, you'd have to go back and figure and reason through the, gram the rules of production. That, that's in fact what happens. Now, now to get, so to follow on with your observation, he, uh, think about what a compiler has to do. You know, so you write a program in C, right? And you want to run it. So the compiler has to translate that program written in C, right, to assembly language. It has to translate it to assembly language. So <clears throat> the C grant the C, the C language is defined by a is specified the syntax of the C programming language is specified by a grammar. So think about the problem that your compiler has to do. What it has to do is it's given a sequence of terminals. How do you do a derivation? Is it possible to do a derivation to get that? 
See, it's not just, it's not just a random derivation. It's, that, oh, somebody wrote down this sequence of symbols. Is this a valid C program? Does it follow the, rules of, the, rule, the syntax rules for the C language? That's what a compiler has to do. So, that's, so part A is just deriving a, part A of this figure, 7.4, is just deriving a valid sentence, just an arbitrary one. But the parsing problem is the problem that the compiler has to solve. You have a proposed sentence. And then can you use the rules of grammar to either give a valid derivation or to prove that it's not valid? That's what a compiler has to do, and that is the parsing problem. So let's see, let's just, let's do it, let, now let's, let's do a parse. So now here in figure 7.5 is a grammar for expressions. And the non-terminals are, and now here, the non-terminal alphabet is capital E, which stands for expression, and capital T, which stands for term, and capital F, which stands for factor. So these are words that are used in mathematical expressions, right? And what is capital, now this is script capital T. T is the terminal alphabet. So what are the symbols in the terminal alphabet? The plus sign, the asterisk, the left, the left paren, the right paren, and the letter A. Right, so these are the terminals. And what are the rules of production? The first rule of production says an expression produces a what? An expression concatenated with? Well, no, not, not, a, not an expression concatenated with what? In rule one, an expression produces an expression concatenated with what? The plus sign concatenated with what? The T. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is everybody clear? That it's concatenated. Right. And what is the second rule? An expression produces a what? A T. And the third one is a, t, a term produces a what? Now a T what? Concatenated with a what? Asterisk concatenated with a F factor. And then four is a term can produce a factor. And then how do we get open and close parens? A factor produces a what? A left paren followed by an ex concatenated with an expression, concatenated with a right paren. And then the F produces A, the last one. And then the start symbol is E, is, is the expression. So now here, let's, how would you do this? So here's our problem. Let's parse left paren concatenated with little a, concatenated with star, concatenated with little a, concatenated with right paren, concatenated with plus, concatenated with a. Is it possible to get this string from this grammar? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think it is. But now, let's think about how we would do it. So you see, how, so first of all, I think we have to figure out about the plus, right? And we have to figure out how those parens are going to get put in there, right? So how are we going to get the plus in there? That's going to be rule one, right? And then how are we going to get the parens in there? Well, we have to go to F first. Yeah, but we have to go to F, but then we're going to have to get to F. So, so E can, can, can give us a what? A T by rule two and then a what? T can give us an F, and then an F can give us the print and the E, and then from the E we can get the what's inside the prints. Does everybody see? So do you notice how we have to kind of look ahead and kind of plan how to do this? Look, you guys. What's the fundamental question of computer science? Look at me, and guess what happens? The computer, the uh, compiler automates all that looking ahead and figuring out. It automates that. The, what we just uh, reasoned through how to do. So here, let's do it. Let's let's parse this. So so e. So what should we use for our first rule? One. I think rule one. So here. So there's rule one. So e plus t. Are we good? And now what about now? You know we could work on the t or we could work on the e. I think I worked on the e first here. So then, then what do we say? E could e could do what? Go to t. So there's a t plus t and by rule two. And then a t can go to a what? To an F by rule four, and then an F can now now an F can go to a what? Paren. To a paren E paren, and then a plus and T. Does everybody see how this is working? And then by rule two, the E can go to a T. And then by rule three, the T can go to a T star F. Yeah, question. I was going to ask, can you can you only do one step, like one change per line? Yes, you can only do one substitution for, per line unless you want to like abbreviate it okay. and say drives in 
a few more steps and use this star. Okay. Yeah. So we do that occasionally. Yeah, because otherwise you'd have to say what the rules are, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, so T star F. And then, the, and then what is this? Rule 4 sends a what to a what? A T to an F. Oh, just like rule 4 did above. Yeah. And now, uh, rule 6, and this first F can go to an A, this F can go to an A, and then this T can go to an F by rule 4, and that F can go to an A in rule 6, and so we did it. Now imagine this, you guys. A compiler does this. This is what a compiler does. It parses when it when it every time you see, every time you write a C program and you compile it, the compiler does this. It takes the string of symbols that you wrote in your program and it has a grammar and it does this. It's automated. What can be automated? Translation. Yeah, question. No. Oh, okay. Are we good? Oh. Like, um, can you start from like the end? So let's say we do like. Um, take the stuff in the parentheses and start with like, and then we do uh, that, Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So the question is, you, you can start from the top down or from the bottom up? That is a super good question and it is a core issue in compiler construction. And there are top down parsers and bottom up parsers. And it's very technical. And if you ever want to get into the, the details of it, it's a very interesting topic. Yeah. So the answer is, yeah, there are, there are different compiler construction techniques. And the, the, the parsing problem is a solved problem. It, it has been solved, you know. So we know how to do, in the early days, you know, when the research was still being done on it, you know, people said, oh, you can do it this way, you can do this. But now it's a very well understood problem and it is a, it is a, it's a solved problem. So there are tech, and if you, if you pick up a compiler construction book or, and they'll, they, you, can, you can see there's, it's really, it uses, all, it uses all kinds of concepts in discrete structures. You know, closure, you know how we did transitive closure and all that kind of stuff. It uses all this discrete math. It's all very mathematical and it's all, it's all a solved problem. Solved as in like someone decided which way was better. Well, yeah, we know what the trade-offs are, and we know the different techniques, and we know we know what, yeah, we know we know several different ways to do it. We know how to do top-down parsing and bottom-up parsing, and we know what the trade-offs are, and we know how to do it all. Is there one that's decided to be best? Well, you know, it's like every, it's like all engineering things. There's trade-offs okay. in certain situations for certain languages. Okay. You know, so yeah, so it's a fascinating topic. Okay, so now in figure 7.6 is a graphical representation of the parsing problem. And you see what happens is uh, in figure 7.6 is what we call a syntax tree. And what it is is it's a graphical representation of the parse. So what happens is it's a, the root of the syntax tree is the what? E. Yeah, in this one it's E. In general it's the what? Oh, it's the start symbol. So we see over here in the previous slide E produces what? E plus T, and that was by rule one. So you, oops, so you see that by rule one, we have the E at the root, and then it produces E concatenated with plus, concatenated with T. So the E and the plus and the T are children. It's an N-way tree, right? And then the E produces the T, and the T produces the F on the left, and on the right, the T produces the F, and the F produces the A, and the F produces the paren E. Does everybody see how that works? Yeah. So when there was like the all those rules, right? Like the production rules. Mm -hmm. So is there like a bunch of production rules for like C plus plus? There are. That's exactly right. There's a whole set of production. There, there's a whole set of production rules for C plus plus. There's a whole set of production rules for Java. There's a whole set of production rules for just about every high level language. And these compilers are all use those production rules to do the compilation. That, that is correct. And you can look that up. That's all documented. If you're interested, really? oh yeah, you can, all, you, you can Google production rules, C++ production rules, and, and there's, there's document, and it's, in fact, well, I, well we're going to see. Uh -huh. Check this out. Oh, and here, by the way, is the syntax tree for the, what was this? This is the syntax tree. Oh, by the way, let's go back to the previous syntax tree. Do you see, if you start from, if you start at the, ch at all the child, sorry, all the leaves. If you look at all the leaves, the leaves of a syntax tree all have what kind of symbols? Terminal. Terminal symbols. So do you see that if you do a traversal and you look at the leaves, it's left paren and then A and then asterisk and then A and then back up to the right paren and then back up to the plus near the root. You see how that, how you read that off? 
So here in Figure 7.7, .7, this is a this is a uh, syntax tree for what stream? Yeah, lowercase d, lowercase d, right? Okay, does everybody see that? And here is your check this out in Figure 7.8. This, what I did in figure 7.8 is this, I took the, the C programming language and stripped off a lot of, it's a subset. The actual grammar is bigger than this. So this is, uh, this is, a, this is a grammar uh, for a subset of the C language. This doesn't have all the, this doesn't have the complete C language. But, but look, what do you suppose, and we're starting at the very top, what do you suppose the start symbol is? For this, for a C program. Translation. Yes, it's translation unit. So you write a C program. The the compiler starts with translation unit, and a translation unit produces either a what or a what. An external declaration or an external declaration or a what. A translation unit what? Concatenated with a what? An external declaration. And what does an external declaration produce? A function definition or a declaration. a declaration. And what does the function definition produce? A type specifier concatenated with a what? Identifier concatenated with a what? Left paren concatenated with a what? Parameter list concatenated with a what? Right paren concatenated with a what? A compound statement. Or, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, does everybody see what's, what's, what's going on? And then a type, <coughs> a type specifier is either. Now, now we have terminal characters, V O I D, or C H A R or I N T. See, it's a type specifier. And then we have a declar declarator list. And here's the state. So how many? What kind of? What does a statement produce? A compound statement, or an expression statement, or a selection statement, or an iteration statement. And an expression statement is. And where do we get our semicolon at the end? An expression statement produces a what? Expression. Should concatenate with a what? Semicolon. So an expression statement has to terminate with a semicolon. Everybody see that? Etc. Etc. Oh, and there's some empty strings. Etc. Additive expression multiple. Etc. Argument constant. Integer constant. Character constant. Etc. And here. Oh, what about identifier? Identifier produces a what? A letter, or this looks familiar. Or a what? Identifier followed by a letter, or a what? Identifier followed by a digit. And then a letter is, are those letters and those are the digits. Everybody see? So now, for one of your homework assignments, uh, you had to do a parse using this grammar. Now, it would be really, really long, it's long enough anyway, but it would be really, really long for you to start, have to start with a translation unit. That would just be. I just wanted to save you some time. So instead of asking you to start with the actual start symbol, is all I'm asking you to do is show that a particular string is a valid statement. So for this particular exercise, you can have the root of your syntax tree. Or the, the, did I ask you to do a parse and a syntax tree or just a syntax tree? I think it's just a syntax tree. So you can put the, the, state, the statement at the top of the, as your root. And then show that W-H-I-L-E, oh, this, in this example, show that W-H-I-L-E concatenated with left parent, concatenated with A, concatenated with less than or equal to, concatenated with nine, concatenated with eight. And then S1 semicolon is a valid statement. And here I say, here again, just to save some time, assuming that S1 is a valid expression. So here's, the, here's a derivation of it, figure 7.9. So notice that what we're starting with here. What, what are we starting with? Statement, OK? Because we want to show that it's a valid statement. What do we, get, what do we end with? While left paren a less than or equal to nine s one. So see, so this is the derivation. And if you look at each line of this derivation, you go back to the grammar and you can see. So what does a statement produce? An iteration statement. And what does an iteration statement produce? While followed by paren, followed by expression, followed by paren, followed by statement. And then what does an expression produce? A relation to expression, and then a blah 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 blah. Yeah, you can see how to do that. This is just to give you a flavor for what it's like in the real world. 
what a real grammar looks like because this is an actual part of the C, C, C programming language. And here's the, oh, and one more thing. Notice we use this, this is getting back to your question, can you do more than one step? What do we see in the last step? You went from expression to S1. Yeah, we went from expression to S1, and that's why we used this notation. This derives in zero or more steps. Okay, because I just, just take too long to, yeah. Would these be stored in the computer as a tree that it searches for? That is a really good question. And the answer is different compilers, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Okay. Sometimes it is. Yeah. And that's all of these. The, it, compiler construction is a big, well developed field, and there's lots, been lots written about it. And you can, yeah, all those, you, you yeah. And yeah, and that, that's, those are good questions. What intermediate forms are there in, in the translation process? And the answer is sometimes there's. De definitely there is, sometimes there's not. Sometimes it does it on the fly. Yeah, it just all depends. Now, I want to make one more point about the C language. If you, let's go back and look at these production rules. What does it look like here in figure 7.8? What is on the left-hand side of every arrow in figure 7.8? A what? What is on the left-hand side? Let's see, here's another page, here's another page. What's on the left-hand side of every arrow? What does it look like? What's on the left-hand side of every production arrow? A single non-terminal. Now, is everybody clear on that? It's a single. So, therefore, what do we know about the C grammar? It is what? It is context-free. It is context-free. The thing is that you need to understand, though, is that the C language itself is not context free. And so that, what that means is that the, the context free grammar is only an approximation. It's only an approximation to the, to the, to the correct syntax of C. And I want to give you, I want to show you, give you an idea of why that is. Look, if you say, if you say int alpha, if you say int alpha, int j, blah, 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 and okay, and so, and you understand what this is? This is a, a, a function that returns type integer and it has a variable like this, right? right? Now, and furthermore, down later in your program, if you want to call alpha and you, and you say k gets Alpha five comma seven. Oh, what should happen? What should what should happen? It'll say, what will it say? So it'll say alpha is in the context of. No no no. If you if you were to write a program and you define alpha this way and you do k gets alpha five comma seven, oh. what, what what will happen? Yeah. Which is this actual or formal? Yeah, so you only have what? One, one. one formal, but you have what? Two, two, two actuals. And so what will the compiler say? More formal, less formal. Yeah, well, so will it compile, yes or no? no? No, it won't. I'm here to tell you that if you write this program, if you, if you write a program like this, <clears throat> according to that, those syntax rules that we just, the grammar that we just looked at, the grammar will pass, it would pass that grammar. Do you see what I'm saying? That grammar doesn't have a way to, to, to say that there's as many here as there are here. <clears throat> because you know how we had as many A's as we had C's? That would take it, that requires a what? A context sensitive, you see. But context sensitive grammars are never used in compilers. Never, there's a way too complicated. So what happens is you have to, the compiler writers have to impose additional restrictions on the language outside the grammar. So the point is that C has a context-free grammar, but C is not a context-free language. And this is why. This, this is an example of why. Everybody, are we good? Let's just stop right here. 
And let's make today's, okay, uh, because we just covered this material, and, oh, and by the way, this needs, I had this, have you had this on, in on paper because it's got all these drawings and syntax trees and stuff. So you can just hand this in on paper. If you want, how about noon tomorrow? If you, want to have, if you want to have some time tonight to do it, then you can hand in by noon tomorrow. And then Monday's assignment, we'll have to have that due on Tuesday, I guess. <laughs> so we'll continue to try to get caught up, but it's, we're too close to ending that to, to start in on, on finite state machines. So we'll do that on Monday, and we'll postpone Monday's assignment. So we'll still try to get caught up. Anyway, we'll, but we'll stay, stay a little bit behind. All right, good deal. See you next time.